Hello, this is Jody Brun from Strategies Canada in Ottawa. And we are joining you today with the speaker series that we have had for the past, I don't know, 13 years or so uh, in Ottawa at a boardroom, first of all, at the Aboriginal Healing Foundation until about 2013 when they had to shut down. And since then at the Public Policy Forum and the boardroom holds about 30 people. Now we have 300. So this is a really, really big upscaling of our operations and I hope it goes well today. I'll know some of you who are watching and others uh, we will be new to this. So we're trying this, this is a new format. It could be very, very excellent to just getting the reach of this series uh, across the country because there are so many people tuning in from, from coast to coast to coast in Canada. So welcome. And today we're gonna have a bit of a different format as well. Uh, we're going to host a panel of speakers and we've got about 30 to 40 minutes for the speakers to present their uh, paper, uh, Mapping the Landscape, Indigenous Skills, Training and Jobs in Canada. And we'll be able to speak with all the various authors of this paper, which is an excellent one, which I, which I read a few days ago and was just released a few days ago as well. So this is an exciting session we're going to have today. It's inaugural in certain senses. And um, looking forward to having a good back and forth uh, with you all via Zoom meeting. So you're gonna be invited to submit your questions after the panelists have presented. Uh, they'll present for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll ask you to use the Q&A um, function in Zoom in order to submit your questions. And that will be after the panelists have been uh, leading the discussion. So that's the sort of housekeeping piece. Now coming to the welcomes, the first thing I'd like to do is to acknowledge where I'm sitting and I, as well as the Public Policy Forum, we are settled here on the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. It's not only traditional, it is unceded territory. There is in fact, there's a, there's a large land claim that's underway. It has been for, for many, many years now and it's not yet resolved. So this issue is still very live where we're from and the participants will indicate where they're speaking from when they get to their piece. Next, I'd like to introduce Karen McCallum. She'll be introducing both the paper and the intent behind it, as well as the various components and the authors who, who took part in it before we get on to the questions with the panelists. So Karen, uh, you were involved with this project, as we said from the beginning, Karen is She's a senior research associate with the Future Skills Center at the Diversity Institute, Ryerson University. So what do you want to say about the paper briefly in terms of what you intended to achieve with it and what it actually entails, Karen? Yeah, thanks so much, Jody. But this paper, uh, I've been working with very intimately for a long time. So it's the ninth in a series of 14 papers that the Diversity Institute is publishing as part of a Skills Next series. So this paper in particular is, um, is, a, really, is a topic I'm really passionate about and eager to discuss with our panelists today. In, in this paper, we're discussing the connection between the future outlook for work and education and the past. So we think it's really not very helpful to think about the future of work and about uh, improving outcomes in the area of education, uh, work, skills training for Indigenous peoples without thinking about the, um, the very complex, as you were pointing to there, Jody, a little bit, um, the, the very the unique landscape of Indigenous skills at the current moment. So in our foundational piece, we're looking at a number of issues that are not usually connected to employment or education. So we're looking at things like uh, disproportionate rates of violence against Indigenous women and girls. We're looking at sky-high apprehension rates of Indigenous children from birth families. We're looking at the chronic underfunding of education on reserve uh, and off reserve in rural and urban contexts. So we're trying to make a link to say that skills gaps, education and employment gaps that we see across Canada today are not, um, they're not unpredictable and they're not surprising, they're very intimately connected to um, histories and contemporary facets of colonization and of the need to, uh, to right the discrepancies that, uh, that create inequities from really, really early, uh, really early days in uh, Indigenous people's lives and Indigenous families. So um, 
I think one of the most important pieces that all of us authors uh, share is that we want to set a foundation and speak about the challenges that exist and make a, make a connection between the future, uh, our future aspirations and the past, but we also want to really stay focused on sort of a strengths-based uh, assets focused approach. So thinking about all the work that is being done, all the opportunities, all the innovations um, that we have to talk about, there's so much. So I would like to uh, sort of point our, our, I almost said readers, but our listeners back to the paper for thinking about more of the context and foundation of, uh, of these issues. But now I'd like to introduce our panelists and uh, kickstart this conversation. So I'll begin with my colleague at Ryerson, Ashley Bouchard. Ashley is the National Indigenous Outreach and Partnership Development Coordinator at Ryerson University's Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, and she's joining us today from Winnipeg. She is currently in Queen, uh, Queen's University's Class of 2021, Master in Management, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and holds a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Manitoba's Asper School of Business, where she was the premier recipient of the full Indigenous Business Scholarship. Uh, Ashley is passionate about supporting the community she lives and works in and currently serves as chair of the Walking Together Grants for the Winnipeg Foundation and as a member on the Board of Governors with Red River College. Uh, Ashley is a proud Indigenous woman with Métis and Ojibwe heritage, hailing from Pine Creek First Nation and Camperville, Manitoba. All right, turning over to, to Andy. Uh, Andy Avdurinos is a research associate at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, a long-standing partner of Diversity Institute where I work. His academic training is in the diverse field of cognitive science, and in addition to being passionate about understanding mental processes or how people think, he also strives to bring a critical feminist perspective to his work. He is committed to doing his part to support reconciliation and is always looking for ways to give back to the Indigenous community. Andy is a co-author on this paper and contributes leagues to CCAB's the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Businesses research agenda in the area of understanding, quantifying, and facilitating growth for Indigenous business. I see Max nodding. And finally, over to Max. <laughs> Max Goja is the Director of Research and Innovation at Creative Fire, and this is a unique organization that Max will be better positioned to explain than myself, so he'll be getting to that in a few minutes. Max has extensive experience in planning, conducting, and analyzing research to shape corporate strategy and government policy. And prior uh, to, to joining Creative Fire, Max spent seven years developing the research arm of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Uh, so working with governments and industry to identify the most impactful ways to increase Indigenous participation in the national economy. Um, Max is also a member of the Canadian Project Consultative Mid Committee for the OECD and sits on the board of the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association. And uh, he is, as I said, another author on the paper. And um, with that, I would like to turn it back over to you, Jody, to launch our conversation. Thanks very much, Karen. So together with you, Karen, uh, we have authors of the papers who of this paper who are also they're, they're very good researchers and also sit at the nexus of research and policy which to me is a kind of very most interesting space to be at and there's a lot of breadth of experience and wisdom from you all there as well and it's definitely evident in the paper i found so i guess we're going to start with max and max you did some of the work on the quantitative pieces on the education levels. Now we're going to get to the good news of the report and there's a lot of good news as well, but to get a full picture of the landscape as a report aspires to do, then we have to also discuss some of the, the, the gaps in the education levels, at least the formal education levels of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples versus uh, non-Indigenous Canadians. So would you like to speak a little bit to that part of the paper and what you think needs to be done to close those gaps? around education levels and training. Absolutely, uh, thank you, Jody, and, and thank you for the introduction, introduction Karen. I'm, uh, my name is Max Kudra, as, as Karen mentioned, I, I work for Creative Fire, which is an Indigenous-owned business owned by the English River First Nation uh, through the Desnete Group. We are the first community-owned uh, professional services firm that works nationally. Uh, as, as Karen had also mentioned, I, I did a lot of research development at CCAB, and so we're really excited to be able to bring that to Creative Fire and grow the data analytics piece of the work because we so think it's so critical for this type of a conversation. 
which you will see why shortly. Um, I think that the big challenge is, is you know, there's, why has this, education seems like such an obvious uh, thing to address. Why is it still such a challenge? There's lots of great, great reasons. There's lots of reasons it hasn't been addressed. And I think one of the biggest is that the way, it, it is such a moving target. You know, the, 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 what's in place now is going to address issues of today in the next 10 years. It's going to close gaps. I think this paper did a brilliant job of identifying many of the gaps that are being closed. Some of the good, good work done in that regard are the more um, traditional indicators that are, that are being um, worked on. But where I think it becomes really concerning is that there is sometimes a sort of an and or conversation about addressing future skills gaps and future problems, which is why I'm so passionate about this work. I think with it cannot be a and or, it has to be an and, it cannot be an or in this conversation. You can't say, you would say for no other group, no one would say for any, no one, you know, that you can either have good education today or an education that's going to suit you for tomorrow. That's unacceptable. It has to be both. It has to be good education now, and we're going to work on making sure the education continues to be appropriate in the next decade. Um, so where I thought, what, some of the really interesting work that I think came out of this paper was when was looking at the sort of some of the work done around skills and careers, and looking at national uh, occupational, uh, looking at national occupational classifications when you compare them to uh, the Department of Labor, Department of Labor's Occupational Information Network, uh, mainly research being done out of the United States, you can broadly identify six clusters of skill set occupations. If you apply Statistics Canada data on Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to that data, you can see some three really interesting trends, uh, and, and similarities and differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous skills. Um, those are actually interestingly broadly mirrored in the business entrepreneurship space as well, which is why this is so universal and so important. Um, what you see is, is generally quite a bit of similarity in uh, sales and services are the most prevalent skills occupations for, for Canadians and Indigenous Canadians alike. So there's, there's generally speaking quite a bit of overlap. Where there's a difference is in the second most prevalent uh, tier, which for most Canadians is, is uh, finance, business and administration. But for Indigenous Canadians, it's um, uh, trades, equipment and construction. Um, that, that is concerning for a few reasons, nothing against those industries specifically. The other theme you see is a, an underrepresentation of Indigenous people in management positions. The reason those two themes are concerning, the second two, is that the, the skills and occupations Indigenous people have now are not as transferable and not as adaptable to the knowledge economy that is being created in this country. Uh, it ditto management. We, management confers a series of skills that are, that is, that are adaptable given, given the disruption that is coming. You see a broad, that is broadly mimicked in the Indigenous business space where there is, you know, the Indigenous economy is diversified, they work in all areas, but there is a slight over-representation in construction, a slight under-representation in the sciences. Where my concern is, today is that while we are working to address a lot of the traditional gaps, the, the university accreditation, et cetera, we're leaving it out this big space of, of, of the industries that are gonna be disrupted. Things like equipment, trades, transport, which is where indigenous people are pre pre often uh, uh, work, are, are important, they're great. They're, in no way is this not on any of those things. The problem is that they will not position, they will, they will not necessarily position people to transition into a knowledge economy as effectively. So if we don't think really clearly today about how are you going to increase indigenous participation, uh, indigenous skill set development in those particular areas, you're going to end up creating new divides in the next decade as the old divides get closed. And you're going to be aiming at yesterday's, today's targets will become yesterday's targets, and you're going to address a bunch of things that will, will, will not fundamentally close the gaps in that in Canadian society. And that's as gloom, doom and gloom as I'm going to get. So, Max, just to follow up a bit on that, um, do you know of any initiatives that might be promising that are helping to close those gaps, maybe in the way that you're saying need to be closed as well? Absolutely. I think there's a number of things. There's a number of existing technologies in the Canadian marketplace today that are focused on skill set development. There's a, 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 and, and where I'm most interested, there's lots of good ones, so I don't want to pick favorites necessarily but I'm most interested in the ones that are able to leverage some of the machine learning tools to identify non-traditional um, opportunities for skill set pairing. 
Uh, in particular, I think that there's a big opportunity in the knowledge economy for Indigenous people to be able to work in or adjacent to their communities, especially as technology becomes, uh, you know, connectivity becomes more prevalent. So, so I guess in terms of at a high level, when I'm looking at solution oriented stuff, that's, that's where I'm most interested. I think that in the Indigenous folks I've had the honor of working with are tremendously resourceful and able. It's, it's, it's just a matter of figuring out how to, how to get those, those links, uh, uh, how to make those links. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we have so far from Max sort of a part good news, part not so good news story and, it's, and a need for both and emphasis. Like you say, it's not a matter of trades and construction being, being poor areas to get into. It's just a, that they don't fill all those gaps as well. So thank you. We'll move on, I think, to Andy, who contributed another piece, the uh, important piece of this paper. Uh, your piece speaks to the rapid growth of the young Indigenous cohorts and uh, what opportunities for the Canadian workforce do you see the cohort to be presenting and what does developing that cohort uh, present to, to Canada as a whole, the Canadian economy? Thanks, Jody, um, and thanks for my kind intro, Karen. Um, my name is Andy, once again. I'm a research associate at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, I wanna give my warm thanks to Public Policy Forum for inviting me to speak on the panel, um, as well as uh, Diversity Institute, Public Policy Forum, and the Future Skills Center for supporting the writing and publishing of the paper. And everyone for tuning in, I hope we can share some useful information. Um, I'm also proud to be speaking to you today from the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the credit. In the spirit of Indigenous History Month, which just, which just passed, I continue to learn more about the land stretching from Lake Ontario to the Niagara Escarpment and encompassing what is currently known as the city of Burlington and its rich Indigenous history and contemporary culture, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis peoples. For those of you who aren't familiar, CCV is a national, nonpartisan, and Indigenous-led nonprofit with a membership of over 900 Indigenous and non-Indigenous organizations with a mandate to create sustainable relations between First Nation, Inuit, and Métis-owned businesses and the rest of Canada. We've been around for over 35 years, uh, and we provide programming, research, and events to support Indigenous businesses. Um, CCB research reports on the size and scope of the Indigenous economy as it relates to the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on Indigenous business currently, procurement, trade and export, Indigenous participation in technology, innovation, and future of work, community economic development, and various other uh, region and sector-specific topics. Um, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jody, we're impact focused. Our work in the research department has informed a $95 million Indigenous Economic Development Fund in Ontario and led to the federal government's adoption of the 5% uh, target for procurement spend on, with Indigenous suppliers. Um, <clears throat> I guess to, to answer your question, um, I think a skilled workforce is a crucial, is, is crucial to the growth of the Indigenous economy um, to form businesses, expand operations, and reach new and international markets. Um, there's an increasing number of successful Indigenous businesses in Canada with over 50,000 firms currently in operation. Um, I highly recommend our foundational report, Promise and Prosperity, to learn more about the characteristics of Indigenous privately owned businesses. The methodology was co-developed with Enveronics Research Group, a leading market and public opinion research firm. And since then, the data uh, have been independently validated by the Office of the Chief Economist at Global Affairs Canada and TD Economics. Um, according to CCB's 2015 Aboriginal Business Survey, uh, conducted with over 1,100 Indigenous business owners, more than one in three create jobs for others, and almost all have at least one Indigenous employee. Um, however, since 2010, the proportion creating full-time or temporary employment has gone down, as has the rate of Indigenous employment within these companies. And this could be due to the widespread acknowledgement of the difficulty finding qualified Indigenous employees particularly among owners of larger businesses. Um, indigenous business owners um, uh, with employees report that they face challenges finding qualified Indigenous employees, but mm -hmm. once they're hired, it's easier to retain them. Um, Aboriginal economic development corporations, um, like the one Max works for, um, these are economic development arms of many communities like Desnathe and Saskatoon. Um, they're also major sources of employment for the community or communities they serve. In 2018, my team traveled to over 100 First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities across Canada 
and we spoke face to face with leadership at 49 development corporations. Mm -hmm. An average of 278 employees work for the development corporations interviewed and their subsidiary businesses, with most reporting one to 150 employees. And this represents a total of 12,220 jobs across all 49 development corporations. Mm -hmm. And we asked them to put this in perspective, we estimate that there are approximately 500 of these across Canada. So most community owned businesses are creating local jobs for indigenous workers and indigenous workers are in turn providing the operational capacity um, to businesses to grow and be successful. Um, and I suppose if there's one thing I could leave you with today, it's that expanding access to relevant high skill education for indigenous students could ultimately promote not only self employment, um, but could lead to more qualified indigenous workers driving existing growth for indigenous companies across regions and, and industries. Thank you, Andy. Um, I have done a little bit of work with some of the some of the uh, representatives of the Aboriginal Capital Corporations too, and they've they've got a lot of businesses that they're supporting, and some of them are in the sort of high tech sectors. And it seems like what they're saying is that this enables people to stay close, like people to stay within their communities and work. Um, did you want to say something? Your paper brings out a point that this sort of press for flexibility, for adaptability, um, for mobility to be able to move to where the jobs are, that that's not always sitting the right way with Indigenous uh, employable workforce. Did you have anything that you wanted to say about that piece and how it might fit with employment by Indigenous businesses? Yeah, I think that um... I think that I mentioned development corporations and I think that they're creating jobs uh, for indigenous people closer to home. Mm -hmm. I think that potentially moving to um, a uh, decentralized um, office as many companies are um, could also keep people um, closer to their communities, uh, keep people uh, on the land more, and also for from the business perspective, could reduce overhead costs like uh, energy bills, and uh, that would be a boon to Indigenous businesses as well. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to Ashley, and Ashley has a very strong background in the entrepreneurial sector, and then also in particular dealing with uh, the entrepreneurship of Indigenous women. Uh, you contribute some of the material on the entrepreneurship to the paper. How does investing in Indigenous business in particular and in Indigenous entrepreneurship contribute to Indigenous economies and then to the Canadian economy as a whole? Would you mm -hmm. share some, some thoughts there? Uh, thanks, Jody, and thanks, Karen, for the introduction. Uh, I'm excited to be joining everyone today from Treaty 1 Territory, which is the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. To put it simply, uh, investing in Indigenous business and entrepreneurship just makes everything a hundred times better for everyone. Um, but to be exact, and as you'll read in the paper, closing the socioeconomic gaps would add over $27 billion to Canada's GDP. There are lots of Indigenous people who are currently living in a legal and regulatory environment that's completely unfavorable for economic development with higher costs of doing business. Higher costs of doing business can sometimes deter investments. Um, in the paper, I also talk about how um, the Indian Act acts as a unique barrier to economic development because Section 89 prevents any personal or real property from being used as collateral for a loan. Um, it's actually three times as complex to start and operate a business on reserve due to bureaucracy from INAC and ban politics. And despite the growth of Indigenous business in Canada, a gap still exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people's access to capital. Closing this gap would inevitably lead to more business development, which then leads to improving the housing, infrastructure, and overall livelihood in Indigenous communities. Right now, Canada is facing the economic challenge of an aging population. And what does the Indigenous community have to offer that we always keep talking about? the youngest and fastest growing population. Um, and this isn't just a buzz phrase that we need to keep repeating. This is an extremely pertinent opportunity that our country needs to invest in and capitalize on. The report goes over some of the current population statistics. Um, 
over 50% of all First Nations people are younger than 30, and the average age of the Indigenous population is eight and a half years younger than the non-Indigenous average age. We also don't need to overcomplicate things. Um, I'm joined by um, Max and Andy today who have been largely instrumental in working with the CCAB. So this network of business support organizations for Indigenous business already exists and the expertise lies within these organizations. All we need to do is invest in these already existing supports to ensure that they have the capacity to carry out what's needed for Indigenous business and entrepreneurship to thrive. We already have an existing national network of 59 Aboriginal financial institutions who are prepared to address all of the unique barriers that Indigenous entrepreneurs are facing today. AFIs actually have a loan repayment rate of 95%, but they're still not sufficiently funded. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association, or NACA for short, um, just recently listed investing in Indigenous women and youth as one of their priorities in their most recent strategic plan. And this commitment is really leading the way for Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs to thrive, and it shows their commitment to um, innovation and supporting the community as, as things change. Um, we also have expertise and solid recommendations put forward by the National Indigenous Economic Development Board. So if anybody's looking for places to find information on what you can actually do, um, I would definitely suggest checking out the NIEDB website and all of their reports. Uh, thanks, Ashley. I, I, I recall seeing too that the investment in the AFIs has really kind of stagnated over the past uh, several years to the point where it hasn't grown in the same measure that it's investment in other areas like safe drinking water or, or housing or whatever have grown, um, it's kind of, once again, it's kind of like an and or discussion and economic development seems to be getting a bit of short shrift right now. you would mentioned briefly um, investing in particular in Indigenous uh, women's entrepreneurship and that this was a priority now of the AFIs and National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. Do you want to say a few more words on how investing specifically in Indigenous women's entrepreneurship would make a contribution? Yes, I would. <laughs> um, I'll start with a little quote, uh, not really a quote, maybe just more of a phrase, but investing in Indigenous women is investing in Indigenous families, which is investing in Indigenous communities, which invests in Canada as a whole. So. If A equals B equals C, et cetera, then investing in Indigenous women is really investing in Canada as a whole. And that's also not just a buzz phrase I'm trying to throw out there. Uh, today, Indigenous women are starting businesses at twice the rate of non-Indigenous women. And Indigenous women are and have been doing entrepreneurial and innovative things long before we even came up with words to describe these actions. When exploring the topic of Indigenous women's entrepreneurship, a common theme of community is often found. Indigenous women aren't starting businesses to start a mega profit-making venture. They're often identifying a need or gap in the community and coming up with a solution to meet that need and fill that gap. Another common motive is just simply trying to make enough money to support themselves and their families. This notion of collectivity in Indigenous women's reasoning for starting a business is a huge reason as to why these businesses are so successful. Investing in Indigenous women entrepreneurs does take more time and effort, but the payoffs are exponential. Indigenous women will be more likely to need support with their business plans and preparing their financials. They're even actually more likely to default on a payment or two because of all the extra roles they're taking on as mothers and caregivers. But however, even with that, Indigenous women are more likely to repay their loans in full and they experience less than half the write-offs that Indigenous men do. Indigenous women are facing compounded and complex barriers to entrepreneurship, which makes it really all the more amazing to watch them succeed and thrive. Indigenous women are water carriers, life givers, mothers, family members, community members. They take on so many roles, so much so that sometimes being a business owner has to come last. We need to adapt our ecosystem to meet this lifestyle need because for too long, we've been trying to fit Indigenous women into a box that was never built for them to fit into. 
I recently held a series of national roundtable discussions in each province and territory with Indigenous women entrepreneurs and business support organizations. We reached over 350 participants and we had discussions around the challenges and barriers that they faced. The most common barriers that came up were they faced challenges accessing financing and capital, a lack of mentorship, and a lack of awareness of opportunities. Okay. Investing in Indigenous women entrepreneurs really does invest in the next seven generations because we are creating role models and mentors. My personal story is not uncommon for many Indigenous women. My family suffered badly from alcohol and addictions. I experienced homelessness at a young age. I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And by the age of 26, I had lost my entire immediate family on my dad's side due to diabetes and addictions complications. None of this stopped me from pursuing my dreams. And I used to get asked this a lot. How did you overcome everything? Or what's the key to resiliency? And I never used to know how to answer it, but over the years, I've given it a lot of thought. My spirit name is Forever Woman. And when I was young, my grandma told me that it means I'm gonna grow up to be a powerful woman, even more powerful than me, as she said. My grandma was a fearless advocate for the Indigenous community, and she was extremely fundamental in founding a lot of the Indigenous organizations and initiatives that we still today. And that's the answer. I had a role model, and she incepted me at a young age with that belief. Despite every challenge I faced, I knew, because my grandma told me, that I was going to continue to push forward. So by investing in Indigenous women, we're creating this generation of role models for young Indigenous women and girls to see themselves in. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at these successful Indigenous women and think to themselves, that could be me. That's great. Thank you. It's both inspiring and also practical. So this is the best kind of combination that you have uh, with, with your recommendations there. We are finished the panel presentation portion of our discussion and we have all the panelists who are going to be staying here for the next, oh, well, we, we could close, we could go to 4.30 if we need to. We have that amount of time and we have a floor that we can throw up and now I have not got experience before today moderating in this kind of venue. So I will say that as a caveat, but I'm going to do my best and I have some questions up here already and please feel free we've got 151 participants on the line here um, please feel free to put forward your questions in the Q&A section and we'll get them and we'll get through as many as possible and we one of the main questions we've had so far has been requests to provide in follow-up we do links to the articles that you're discussing today and of course we will definitely be doing that and that would be both for this paper itself, uh, which is one of the first ones in the Skills Next series, and then also a link to the Skills Next uh, web page so that you can pick up some of the other papers as well. So we will definitely follow up with that. And as I said before, it's a great paper. It's got a lot of depth in an area where quite often there's not the depth one would hope or the understanding of the historical con context as well. So we have uh, questions coming up. I have to read them out here to you. So the first question is for Max. Uh, Max, the trends are showing more younger Indigenous learners graduating from high school and college. Therefore, can one assume or predict that Indigenous Gen Z and younger millennials will be entering a knowledge economy? Do you share that view? With um, well, I would, I, I did, certainly do. I think that the, the, the issue is not, are the numbers rising? I think is the, are the numbers rising at the pace of the Indigenous population is, is more of the question, right? It's, it's not just, are the, yeah, is, certainly the numbers are improving. It's great, like on, on many, many levels. And I think this paper does a brilliant job of outlining a number of the areas in which uh, that progress is happening. I think that it, we also mentioned it, and I think Ashley it just made a great, great, highlighted a number of areas the, the youth of Indigenous people. So even if the, the, the numbers overall are getting better, it, it is also the numbers relative to non-Indigenous, uh, to, to the growing population. I think it's, you actually, you see it quite clearly. I, I remember seeing that Indigenous women with master's degrees actually make more than non-Indigenous men or women with master's degrees. Um, so I think that, that that transition is there. Um, but I don't think that it's enough given a number of the historically very obvious systemic sort of challenges to just assume that it's gonna be a, a great transition and, and that no hurdles are gonna come up in between now and, and, and then. Um, I think that that would be 
very short-sighted. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity and it's in many ways we're trending well, but that's not, it, we're not in a position to rest on our laurels on a lot of these issues. Now, if I can chime in to add to what Max is saying, we have graduation rates, uh, high school uh, accreditation rates, but we also have literacy skills and numeracy skills. So not everyone who graduates with a high school degree has the advanced uh, literacy and numeracy skills to continue to learn throughout their life, to uh, pursue future education if they want to, to get into their apprenticeship program or pass their levels or apply and succeed at college, uh, or to upskill and continue training throughout the workplace, which is what we hear in every conversation about the future of work. We're hearing everyone is gonna have to be a, a perennial student and lifelong learners are what we need for the future. So. We're looking at high school graduation rates, but we're also looking at at, um, at skill level and do we have equal, uh, equally advanced skill levels in literacy and numeracy? And we, and we don't. Um, the the numbers are quite stark. So until we can close the gaps in between skills as well as in graduation rates, then then there's still a, there's still a lot of work to do. Thank you. The next question we have is once again from Max. Did you look, Max, at the interprovincial trades program as represented in the national occupational analysis and the representation of Indigenous peoples with Red Seal trades qualifications? Are they represented in trades qualifications? In order to get into management in the trades, for example, it's usually important for us to have a Red Seal. At what level, apprenticeship or Red Seal or management, are Indigenous people employed in the trades, equipment, and construction? Um, I didn't at least personally get that in the weeds in terms of the specifics of the quali sub qualifications within, uh, within the categorization. I think something that's really important to note is this type of research with Indigenous folks is not, it, it, a lot of it's fairly new. So it's, while, while much of this work would have been done in other categories, it either hasn't been done or hasn't, or, or you know, it, it's, it's still a work in progress, I guess you could say. I think that the red seal point is a good one. I think that we, with a lot of our work working with indigenous um, businesses, for a long time, union uh, certification was identified as, as a real challenge. I know that a lot of the unions are doing some great stuff now to adapt their programming. But if you need to put a certain number of hours into um, working with, with a, within a union to, to get that red seal, that can be a real struggle based on, you know, depending on where you live. So you could have a lot of, say, carpentry skills and welding, but you may not have had the, uh, the field hours. So I think that that is, that's a really good example of where you need to drill down to very specific skill set focused solutions as opposed to sort of the, 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 the broader sort of credentialing. You did mention too, as a general point, that the management positions across different sectors are not as heavily represented. Absolutely. Okay. And we do also see while the apprenticeship level attainment and college graduation rates are, are rising actually higher than university graduation rates amongst indigenous populations. And we do see management, like you were saying, Jody, management occupations are more linked to people having a university, mm -hmm. so having a university degree. So it's again related to that um, it's not quite a glass ceiling, but like the, the ceiling at which you are able to advance in your career is, is tied to your, your attainment level, um, how far you get in your levels. But uh, it's a really good question. It's an area where there's really a need for more research and investment. Thank you very much, Gabe, for that question. I have a question now for Andy. So Andy, here is your question. Um, this is from Alana. What kinds of skills are Aboriginal businesses having difficulty in finding among Aboriginal workers? Um, that's a really, really good question. And certainly the, the topic for uh, a topic for further research. Um, I would just reiterate what, uh, what Karen said that um, education and skills training from, from basic literacy and numeracy through to higher level qualifications um, are essential for economic security in the new global economy. Um, and that foundation of learning is important so that Indigenous workers are able to upgrade their skills throughout their careers. STEM skills, um, science, technology, engineering, and math skills are also becoming exceptionally relevant. Um, and most current education systems are based on models put in place over a century ago. And I think it'll be, it's um, interesting and also a very fruitful endeavor to see how Western and uh, Indigenous thought and pedagogy can mutually um, inform and, and enrich one another. 
This is actually a question we have. It's a great follow up on, on what you just said there. And it's unfortunate the attendee is anonymous because it's such a good question. Um, there is a lot of research suggesting soft skills are necessary to adapt to the future of work, which you've also said, Karen. How should we think about this with an Indigenous lens? Um, are there nuances to developing soft skills from an Indigenous perspective that, that we aren't yet hearing about? From, from, a, from, first, I should just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not Indigenous, right? I'm, I'm, I'm awakened from Toronto. So I'm, I'm currently living on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the New Credit. But for me to answer this question, I'll do my best as somebody who's been around the space a lot. But, you know, I, I don't want to overstaff in that sense. I would say that a lot of it is where, you know, my experience with a lot of Indigenous folks is very place-based in their communities. And so understanding specific community traditions, histories and cultures and applying that in some way is, is really, I think, appropriate or relevant way to look at building um, how to understand some of the soft skill development. Which, and it's a great question. I think it's super important. And I think absolutely in indigenizing the lens of education and, and skills development um, and taking, taking um, that approach, I think, is incredibly important to telling stories, building curriculum and, and that are relevant to folks. And everyone responds better to what's relevant to them. You know, I don't think that that's a unique thing for anyone. If, if you're telling a story that I can relate to, I'll relate to it better than if, than if not. So I think that that's a hugely important piece. Has anyone seen examples where this has been done before? This sort of indigenized or indigenous lens or perspective on soft skill development in the way that you've been speaking of? Or is this an area that's just like wide open and it's for it's to be taken on sort of as a next? There's, uh, there, there's, but there's no, a company called Origin um, out of Thunder Bay, CC members, uh, that, that Creative Fires really uh, loves talking to and working with. They, just, they do VR training, so you can do on on site VR in community uh, training for 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 you know generally speaking um, sort of uh, primary construction type roles, fair play, but they also have a whole series of other skills available. They all, they do workforce interest identification based on traditional uh, animals and themes and, and, and characterize the characteristics of individuals. And then they have a great program that under, seeks to understand sort of elements of traditional history, culture, and knowledge, and impart that on, on, on younger generation as a way of telling stories using uh, technology and virtual reality that I think is really, really cool. And build soft skills and understanding in a way relevant to folks in the community. If I'm trying to understand what career paths I'm most interested in, being able to tell the story uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that resonates is, is really helpful. And I think they do a fantastic job of that. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Jay Jacko. Uh, uh, just a statement, I find that the reason why trades are the biggest growth for Indigenous youth are because most of our parents grew up doing those jobs. So we follow what we know. Also, trade schools are coming to do mobile classrooms to teach on reserves. So that's a policy decision too, right? So my question is, how would we be able to educate in those management and science areas? I guess it's a bit of similar to this last question. Well, I'll jump in right off the bat and say workplace uh, integrated learning and workplace based training is a real opportunity. So if you have someone who works on the shop floor and you want to train them, who's got, you know, all of who's got their red seal and you want to train them to a management position, that's a decision you can make as a as an employer, as, as a business, mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to um, whether you want to provide the professional development to somebody who you see has the potential to lead. Uh, and, uh, and work it out at a higher level. But we also do see, statistically speaking, just a link between people who are in management and who have university accreditation or post-secondary degrees. That there are opportunities for, for businesses to fund higher education for their employees or to have workplace-based um, and professional development uh, programs. So there's, there's opportunity for the employer side to get involved and to foster those kind of pathways to advancement as well. I guess I can speak um, just about my work with Red River College because they are um, a trades and technology institute. Uh, I think that um, along with many of the other post-secondary institutes across Canada, Red River College has put um, Indigenous achievement as one of their you know main strategic priorities going forward. So really, I think um, the challenge that Red River is facing right now is how can we attract and then also retain 
Indigenous students in our programs and not only urban Indigenous students, but remote Indigenous students as well. Um, there are satellite campuses uh, around the province, but it's also really about enhancing the current uh, curriculum and programming to meet the lifestyle needs of Indigenous students who a lot of them are coming to Winnipeg, which is an urban area, um, and they've lived on the reserve their whole life. So this is the first time. So there needs to be transitional programming just to get them, you know, ready to go to day one of their program. But then um, I'll use an example. So they recently um, put together a, a baking cohort. It was called the Rising Hope Bakery. My cat is here. This is Taco, everybody. Um, <laughs> um, so the Rising Hope Bakery was a one-of-a-kind program. It was the first time they'd ever tried it. Um, it was a small cohort. I believe it was about seven or eight students, um, and I think half were Indigenous. And this program really, uh, they finished the program with a regular baking certificate like any other Red River College student would, but they had incorporated um, a smaller classroom atmosphere. It was a more intimate learning experience. They had Wednesdays as like a no school day. It was called the taking care of business day because there's so many things that you need to attend to in your daily life. And the regular Red River College programs are really strict and they, they take up almost all of your time. So it was really... Um, I think that the leadership at Red River took a step back and thought, you know, the motto at Red River is what we're doing is working. So how can we make that true for all Indigenous students experience? And the baking program was wildly successful. Um, and I think that using that model and applying that lens to other programs is going to be the way that they'll see more success with Indigenous students. I also just wanted to mention um, one of uh, CCAB's certified Aboriginal businesses, uh, Animki Technology, um, headquartered on uh, Coast Salish territory. Um, they do a lot of pro bono and, and volunteer work in high school classrooms and, and trade shows. Um, and uh, I think what's been very successful is workshops, formal and informal mentoring programs, and career expos targeted at Indigenous youth. Um, particularly with exposure to business leaders that, that have succeeded from the community. Um, and especially um, these pathfinding, uh, th these companies breaking into high-tech industries can go a long way toward convincing Indigenous students that there is a future for them in technology-based careers. I think that that's, you know, that's a great point, Andy, and, I, and, and, and Ashley. I think that the... Is, is it, it is a shameless plug, but a shameless plug with a reason. I think supporting Indigenous businesses that are in those areas is, is really important. Again, I'm not Indigenous, but we have a real, at Creative Fire, which is a professional services firm owned by a First Nation, there's a real push to make sure that there's Indigenous inclusion, not just in general in, in the team, but at a leadership and, and at, a, at an executive position, right? So I think that my experience and the data I know bears this out is that Indigenous businesses are more likely to prioritize and succeed in that. Um, so if there are ways to either work for or engage with Indigenous firms, that's, um, I think that that's a really material way to make a difference in this space. Creative Fire is one of those. Okay, we have, uh, we have about five or six more questions, so I'll take a few more here from, from George for Ashley. Uh, what three action steps would you recommend for individuals who want to help amplify women's voices in the entrepreneurial space. What resources or spaces would you would allow us to move past conversation and incite meaningful action? Three action steps. I guess uh, that's a good question. I think the first step I'd say is for when you want, when you really want to hear um, Indigenous women's voices and make space for them, it really is important that men Indigenous and non-Indigenous and, you know, non-Indigenous women really do make the space for Indigenous women's voices. I think that it's true across the board. Everybody wants to be a part of the conversation. I truly believe that people who are at these tables want to see Indigenous women succeed. But I think just having that self-awareness to realize that the floor is not for you right now, it's your time to listen. Um, that goes miles for creating spaces for Indigenous women to share um, truly their experiences and their knowledge. Another thing you could do is 
if there's a product or service that you're looking for, it's almost guaranteed there's probably an Indigenous woman in Canada somewhere providing that product or service. So right now, I know it is a bit of a challenge to uh, locate Indigenous women-owned businesses or even Indigenous-owned businesses. Uh, I know on the CCAB website, they have a listing of their members, um, but for Indigenous women specifically, I know that there are a couple organizations who are working on an initiative to make a database of this so it is easy to find. And if you're looking to support an Indigenous business, um, you know online where you can go to look for that. And what resources can allow to move past conversation and incite meaningful action? Mm -hmm. I think that that, uh, well, the space that I'm trying to create or I am creating with the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, um, it started off largely with community consultations, a lot of outreach, but the point of all of these was to really create tangible actions that we can all take at the national and regional levels to support Indigenous women's entrepreneurship. So it is about um, making a commitment. So not only saying that you do want to support Indigenous women entrepreneurs, but how are you actually going to do that? Um, and at a personal level, I think you could do that by supporting Indigenous women-owned businesses. But let's say um, you're an investment company or a financial institution, are you going to create programming that's accessible for mm -hmm. Indigenous women entrepreneurs? Because I think that maybe um, Indigenous women are accessing these programs in low numbers, but that's not because they wouldn't benefit from or need this support. It's really just because they feel like that program is not for them or there's a barrier. So just taking some steps to um, make things more accessible. Thank you, Ashley. That was very well done, I thought. That was a very, very specific question, and you came up with uh, yeah, exactly. so, some well-considered answers, so thank you. There are a few questions here that I'd like to actually sort of take all together, because I know, having read the paper, that you have good answers for them. And those are ones talking about the, um, asking about what, when, when you talk about Indigenous people, how are you understanding this population? Are you breaking it down by identity? First Nation Inuit Métis in the study. Do you break it down regionally? Do you break it down on and off reserve? Uh, another question asks, are you talking, when you talk about indigenous people, what groups are you talking about? Are you talking about clan? So maybe, I, I know you treat this at some length in the paper, you might want to explain a little bit about how you deal with this um, there. Could I jump in? Uh to start. Generally, I think what's really important about this paper is um, sometimes um, Indigenous realities or the Indigenous skills ecosystem is measured imperfectly by social, educational, and economic indicators that only serve to reinforce negative stereotypes and myths about Indigenous peoples. So I think we tried to be um, Careful, more careful, and this paper provides context on differences between particular groups, say First Nations, Inuit, Métis, status and non-status, um, living on or off, uh, First Nation Reserve, Métis Settlement, or Inuit Uningat. Um, their constitutional relationships, um, circumstances, and the implications for skills development. And you know, we hope to spur further discussion that will inform targeted programming and policies to enhance the overall labor market participation and socioeconomic outcomes for Indigenous people. Um, but, um, but by carefully discriminating um, between those groups, those, imp those, important, um, uh, those important differences. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'd just like to say there's something that, um, that uh, the director of the Yellowhead Institute, Hayden King, uh, wrote an article ages ago that really stuck with me about, I think maybe it's the title of his article. It says, uh, we, it's, uh, we natives are divided and there's nothing wrong with that or something like that. And I think that's just like an underlying assumption of the paper that there's incredible diversity that we can't even, uh, like we don't get into clan membership. This paper is not going to be the answer for skill development for your community in this particular place. But I think what we have done a good job of is said we have um, we have relationships with the crown across the country for uh, you know incredibly complex and specific legal uh, geographically regionally treaty specific relationships. We can't really talk about a group, but there is a 
there is relevance to thinking about the idea of indigenous as a political, uh, as, a, as a group that requires uh, program specific funding, uh, research specific, uh, it, I mean, it's such a slippery thing where it's relevant and not relevant at the same time to even think of the idea of, of indigenous as a meaningful category. But please um, engage with us more and read the paper and please, we're open to fe feedback. We think we've made uh, indistinct um, categorizations or we could have done a better job. Actually, I think one of the strengths of the paper, it's, it's a modest strength though too, because you do say at the beginning, you know, this is a, we're not actually doing original research here. And then you also say too, we're not making policy recommendations, but you certainly through very solid research uh, bring up some policy points that do require further consideration. So that in itself, just sort of asking the right questions is the very first step to doing good policy. And I think that this paper really does sort of point in the way to the questions that should be asked. And because you don't have the answers, it, it's not necessarily a negative comment on the paper. <laughs> it's just a matter that, uh, that you're, you're bringing it to the right place. So, so I do once again encourage people to read it. Uh, we have a question that's a little bit specific, but I think it brings out a more general point. And I don't unfortunately have the name of the person, uh, but one of the things that bothers me, uh, it says uh, Northern, some, someone from the North, I think, when looking for job positions after having graduated college with two diplomas and an EMT B certificate with 2.5 years, what do you think of indigenous name titles for job positions? rather than, you know, the indigenous person, I guess, coming up and occupying this, this, this lofty job that's got no indigenous sort of um, uh, connotation to it, what would you think about indigenizing maybe job position titles? I think it's good. It's a good thing and a bad thing. And it really kind of comes down to whatever company has created the position, their commitment behind it. I think it's 2020, um, having an Indigenous titled position and a non-Indigenous person filling it, uh, the time for that is over. Um, there never should have been a time for that. And I think I saw that uh, in the questions, um, the RBC program was mentioned. So really that's what I mean, it, it really just depends on the commit. Let's look at universities, for example. There's lots of universities across Canada right now who are creating the position vice provost of Indigenous engagement or something along those lines. If the Indigenous uh, or if the university is creating this position in a tokenistic way and they're just hiring this person to be like, reconciliation, we've done it, then of course that's that's not good. But if they're really trying to incorporate this position into the fabric of the university and really rework and indigenize the institution, then I think that it's a good thing for that position to have an indigenous specific title. And that's just an example, but I mean, in, in any context where that's the case. I really, really like that point. I 100% agree with you. I'd, I'd, I'd add to that that, you know, there's been some really great work done demonstrating that language in job applications can lead to increased of certain target groups um, applying for those jobs. Gender is the one that I hear about the most, where if you, it's, it's not that you change the substance of the rule, you just frame it slightly differently. You actually get significantly, uh, you, you know, much higher, a uh, much broader group of people coming into the position. So I think that if it's, if, if it's not done tokenistically, I couldn't agree with that point more. But I think that if it was, it, it, it also has the potential of maybe um, increasing Indigenous engagements in those roles, um, which I think would be a real material added bonus. Thanks, Matt. Karen? And just add in one, one more point on this. I'm thinking about the employer side. So there's the creating potentially this non-tokenistic Indigenous both vice provost of university. But then there's also a lot of work. I think um, Ashley was talking about reflecting, reflecting on and being self-reflexive. So on an organizational level, uh, is your workplace, is your university going to be a safe, culturally relevant, uh, good place for your Indigenous vice provost to work? So we've heard a lot in, in some industries, I'm thinking of uh, construction industry in Northwest Territories. I had a chance to sit down with the uh, with a representative from one of these companies. And he was saying one of the most important pieces they want to address in their 
uh, in their company is workplace bullying harassment issues. And this is a piece that's picked up in some research that's taken place in the North that there are, uh, there's a need for employers to take responsibility for making the workplaces a safe place for, uh, in that specific example, those Inuit workers to be. But there's a lot of work to be done on the uh, kind of, uh, yeah, making, making workplaces a place where your, where your Indigenous specific employee wants to be and wants to stay. Thanks, Karen. This is an interesting sort of different take here. Um, a question from Mohan. Hi, Mohan. Um, is there a way we can create more value for traditional activities and skills so that it is a bigger part of the contemporary economy? Uh, it's the flip side argument for increasing skills for Indigenous people to join the mainstream economy. So I guess to some extent it's sort of, you know, indigenizing the economy and not simply um, having, having this, the, the, the flexibility, the adaptability to fit to a mainstream norm. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. And I think that even with um, COVID-19 and the way uh, it's affected the entire country and the world, um, it's not that Indigenous populations don't have skills, they have skills, but it's just to the level of how we're recognizing what skills it is that they have. Um, and I think, so I, I brought up COVID because um, the grocery stores were completely swarmed back in March. Uh, they were out of everything, toilet paper, canned food, rice, fresh vegetables. So it started this little movement of creating small micro farms and community gardens so that that would never happen again. We would never be in a place where we're not able to access food. And there are a lot of three sisters gardens. There are a lot of indigenous people out on the land who still hunt and trap as a way of living. So those are definitely skills that I think the non-indigenous community could learn from and apply today. Thanks, Ashley. I just have a, a couple quick points um, from um, my experience uh, in the research department at CCAB. Um, first, there are um, companies around the world that are expropriating and commercializing indigenous intellectual property, which is hugely valuable. Also, we use terms now, we, we, you know, perhaps we could use more investment in the social economy. We use terms currently like um, social finance, so social entrepreneurship, and social innovation. And um, in my personal opinion, indigenous businesses have been doing this since time immemorial, having, um, uh, having a social impact, having both profit-driven uh, activities and having a social impact. Um, so I think we could s support, and, and many of those businesses, they have, um, they're community driven, they have traditional knowledge and culture um, built in, the preservation of traditional knowledge and culture built into their uh, missions and mandates. And um, so perhaps uh, one of the ways we can support um, Indigenous business is through the social economy. Or it sounds too like you're saying almost take a page from that book also with the current emphasis that we're having on a social economy and social impact in addition to profit, that that's actually something that Indigenous people have been, been doing for a long time. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have uh, another question and this is, this is important because you do get a little bit in the paper into the digital and digitization movement too. Uh, I haven't heard yet any discussion on information and communications technology for skills training and in particular cybersecurity. Given the current landscape and demand to build workforce capacity, I'd like to understand the level of interest within the Indigenous community to learn these types of skills. So IT specific, um, cybersecurity, I think we agreed we were going to pass the hard questions to Max. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would say, and I am very open to being overruled on this, but I, I, I wanted to comment on cybersecurity in specific because it's a little too particular. I, I just don't know cybersecurity versus general IT versus programming or coding, etc. I would say overall, um, I would say there is, you know, one of the issues that we identified earlier in this conversation was awareness of opportunities. And I would say that what some, one of the challenges may be is an awareness of how to make some of those opportunities practical. Like what's the path to get there for, for some indigenous communities. There's some amazing 
um, work being done. Andy already noted Enemiki um, out of out of uh, um, out of Victoria. There's the Steam Academy in, um, in in Southern Ontario. There's there's some really great work. I know uh, Tata Consultancy Services were doing some great stuff, working on uh, engaging with Indigenous folks, and CCIB partnered on that. And I know Creative Fire is very big on this type of stuff, where it's how do you take technology? This is something we're very interested in now. How do you take this technology working with Origin? And, and, and engage with Indigenous people with this technology to find solutions to their day-to-day -day problems. And I think that's where you really are going to see some explosive innovation in Indigenous communities. I know in uh, Moosney First Nation, or Moose, Moose Creek First Nation, you know, Moosney, it's basically, you've got to take a Polar Bear Express, it's up, it's up in James Bay, and it's separated from the mainland. Um, and if you take a skiff, a little outboard motor to get there in the summer, but it's very difficult to get to and get supplies to in the winter um, or, or in the summer in the winter. So they're using drones to fly medical supplies. Um, I think there's these technological solutions. Um, you, this is where I was so focused on and not or. It's, there needs to be the and. You need to, the, the sophisticated programming and statistical and engineering. There, there's no substitute for that and there should be no um, um, uh, continents. You should not like re re reduce that. And we know some great, we work with some great indigenous statisticians, Big River Analytics, Hannes Edinger. But there's also uh, room for taking those technologies and applying them in a, to solve practical real world problems in communities. And I think that that's something we're really keen on working out and, and, and addressing because I think that that's, um, that is what is going to spur the interest in communities in this type of discussion. When they actually, when folks see it and see what it can do, that's when you're gonna to start to get to spark that inspiration. Thanks, Max. No, I was just gonna um, jump in and be a downer for a second. Um, I think it's also important um, that the, everybody in the country realizes that there's so many indigenous communities who are not even ready to be at the table to have this conversation around capitalizing on um, technology and innovation. Um, there's 61 long-term boil water advisories in Canada still to this day. So when you're trying to just focus on these fundamental things to survive, like access to adequate housing, clean drinking water, a road, um, thinking about, you know, these things that we are thinking about now in terms of technology and innovation, it's just not everybody is ready to be at the table. And I love Max for you, you pointed out those amazing examples. Some communities are, and I think that we need to continue to work with and grow capacity in those communities, um, but then still recognize the, the other side. Absolutely, absolutely. Andy? I was going to bring up another example uh, of an indigenous owned IT company that um, is finding innovative solutions, but I, you know, uh, I think we've we've made the point, and 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 actually, uh, to your point, um, you know, I think we do we do need to keep in focus the fact that there are existential um, threats to to solve first before we can uh, before we can have discussions about around innovation and technology. Potentially, though. There could be a role, even in those situations, for for promoting entrepreneurship and Indigenous-run businesses, as well as sort of an empowerment to community members. Did you want to speak some more to the nuts and bolts of how to encourage this? There's another question we have from an anonymous attendee. What are we doing to build confidence in the Indigenous population or communities to apply for jobs or build businesses? And um, I have another sort of follow-up questions, like what can people personally do to support indigenous run businesses? How can they find them? Like, what can they do? So maybe just those two pieces before we, before we close. Why indigenous? And yeah. how do you know though? Um, you know? On social media, yeah, look up the hashtag uh, by indigenous. Okay. Um, you could look at the CCAB website um, for the, the listing of all of their members or recipients of their awards. I'm not sure if those are all members already, actually, but um, there's, it, I'm not going to lie, it does take a, a bit more work to find Indigenous-owned businesses, but um, I think that in making that step and promoting Indigenous business, promoting by Indigenous, it's just going to help to, um, there is a lot of, I guess, uh, 
racism that indigenous entrepreneurs still face in their businesses are seen as being less than the non-indigenous option, which is, I mean, obviously not true. <laughs> um, so, but I think that with that exposure um, and, you know, giving indigenous owned businesses the opportunity to build their capacity, it's just going to be a snowball effect. Thank you, Ashley. You know, the other piece of that question was, what are we doing to build confidence in the Indigenous population to apply for jobs or to build businesses? How do we encourage Indigenous business development? You did mention the AFIs and the good work that the Aboriginal financial institutions are doing. Did you have any more points you wanted to make on that piece? Well, at the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub and also at the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association, um, we're going to be uh, running separate but similar role model campaigns. Um, we're going to be featuring Indigenous women entrepreneurs, um, highlighting their successes, just so that uh, young Indigenous women and girls can see themselves in a role model. I, I know I mentioned this before, but I just think having role models and mentors is just so, it's the pinnacle um, to really planting that seed of resiliency in young people. I lost where I was going. What was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> just the, the, what, what are we doing or what could be done too, I would say, not only what are we doing, but what could be done to build confidence um, in Indigenous people, whether women or not, to, to build businesses or to apply for the jobs? That was the question. I think it comes back to what Ashley was saying. We've all been circling around. There's building the confidence and the capacity, and it's also just removing the barriers on the other side. Like if you're offering a skills, I heard about a skills program in the Yukon where there was a math upgrading program that was being offered and it was very inflexible. It was offered at 8 a.m. across town. So all of the, and it was upgrading uh, uh, women's skills, but all, almost all of the women who were taking part of the program were moms. Most of them were single moms and they couldn't afford a car. So to get your kid out of bed to school, then catch the bus to the other side of town for 8 a.m. is not tenable. So nobody, everybody dropped out. It's just like, there isn't a one size fits all solution. It's just like, think about it. Think about who you're trying to reach and what they might need. They might need childcare, they might need transit tickets, or they might need Wednesdays off uh, to take care of business, or they might need a 10 a.m. start time. So I think if you are in a position of you're making policy, you're running a business, you're responsible for your workplace training initiatives, you can think about and you can have conversations with people who know more than you about how you can get in the door and keep in the room the people that you're that you're trying to reach but there is unfortunately not not a one one ticket uh solution for that one that makes sense i also really really like sort of ashley's point earlier around mentorship and i think that you had the two of the three uh ways to support people but I, if i could put in a third it might be to support champions to support indigenous uh, women women champions i'm just thinking you, you were talking about niedb and, and NACA, you know, there's a woman named Don Madabi who runs an AFI called Wabatek in, you know, um, in Manitoulin Island. And her and I were talking a little while ago and she mentioned, you know, she, she didn't even think of it. And when, but she did a review of all the, all the loans that she's made at, at Wabatek. And over half of them, 50 something odd percent, went to indigenous women entrepreneurs, not intentionally, not, it wasn't a program, it was just, you know, 20 or 30 years of her work and that's what it had come to. So I think when you see folks like that and you can support them, it's another tangible, great way um, to make a difference. And also, um, Max, I think, you know, we've, at CCAB Research, we have a lot of discussions around how to measure the socioeconomic impacts of uh, indig Indigenous economic development. And uh, a sense of pride is, is often, you know, a difficult metric to quantify, but it's um, from what we've heard anecdotally, it's so important for a community to have a business with a logo, their, their logo on the side of a truck or, you know, CCAB awards or when Cheekbone Beauty um, makes a, a post on Instagram, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very important to, uh, to celebrate the successes of the Indigenous economy. That makes sense. Thank you. So we have a, a final question coming from Sharon. 
the paper is recommending that more research be done. And the question is, uh, are there gaps or opportunities for additional research or testing of ideas or models of innovation that would positively impact employability or entrepreneurship for Indigenous peoples, including by age, gender, or geography? Are there gaps or opportunities for further work? I'm gonna pull, I just wanna commend the attendees for the detailed <laughs> and complex questions they're giving us. Yeah. <laughs> my, my impression is that there, there is an opportunity and a gap <laughs> that you all have sort of turned up through this research uh, on all kinds of different fronts for further work to be done. I'd, I'd say even in our questions, you know, you get at it, there's, you, you can do a lot of this work now pretty effectively at the level we're doing it, you know, at this sort of 30,000 foot indigenous wide, you know, there's value in that, especially when we're very upfront about what we can tell you, what we can't tell you, what you can do, like, no one's trying to be boastful about what the power of where we are. We, we, we've got some great stuff, but it's not, um, there's a lot of holes. And even the, the questions we've, we've seen today, you know, around um, um, uh, the, the Red Seals around uh, clan, around uh, around specific identity groups, around getting into that more granular, specific content. Like, it, to my knowledge, that doesn't exist. And I think that that, it's great. What, what we're talking about here is really important because it puts some big question marks on the table. Um, and I think from, it's able to identify some of the problems that we know as people working in the space exist and give it, give it a data backbone. But that's not sufficient for proper solutions for proper solutions you need much more specific data you need much more focused outcomes this is a tremendous first step i think but it's that's what it is it's not um the end of the conversation mm -hmm. and also when when you read the paper it does end on um some really pointed questions for further discussion and research and just kind of highlighting the areas where uh this paper didn't really get the chance to cover um and like Max said, there were specific questions today about even breaking it down by gender, by region, by First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, status, non-status. There's so much diversity in the Indigenous community. You could really um, run wild with breaking it down in so many different ways. But um, at the end, I would um, encourage everybody to read those questions and use those as the base uh, for your discussions going forward. I should add, um, at the end of this question is a comment, such an important webinar. So I think that really speaks to the quality of the work that you all have done and uh, the quality of the conversation today. And I apologize, I'm in the dark now here in Ottawa. I'm speaking to you from the dark, probably darker than Andy but who, with the Northern Lights. But I don't know what happened. I think there's a storm coming or something, but <laughs> natural lighting gave out. Uh, this, I think, has been an excellent sort of first experiment for our series, and it's really, really encouraging to see how many attended from across the country. It's just, wow, look what COVID-19 has enabled. Um, it's, uh, it's been very, very informative, and I think we got a good depth of conversation despite the format here. Uh, many of the attendees requested a list of organizations and resources that were referenced today, and we will endeavor to get those to you as a follow-up to the session, as well as the link to the paper itself. So we will be following up by email, I think, uh, with, uh, with that information. And also, if you wanted to write back to us and let us know how you found it, how we could improve it uh, the next time around, that would be very helpful as well. We don't have a next speaker identified yet. We had to get sort of restarted after dropping everything in March. But this has been a really, really great um, resumption of the speaker series and a great way to sort of go national. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists. This was a, this was a great discussion and it's a really worthwhile paper and much appreciate your, your giving your time and your thoughts. So thanks everybody. And I think on that note, we'll close.